everybody and welcome to the advanced traction control and stability control video presented by AutoAid. And just to give you some background, um, this is pretty standard background stuff. Originally, um, stability control was only installed on high-end vehicles, but legislation uh, enacted in Canada and the U.S. has mandated that it be now installed on all, all vehicles, I believe, built after 2012. In kind of a nutshell here, they're trying to legislate bad driving. I'm not sure that's even possible, but uh, if you take a look at what's happening with the cars these days, with the ADA systems and that kind of stuff coming on board, it seems like we're giving more and more control of the vehicle over to the car. Now, our objectives in this class, uh, we're gonna take a look at component and system operation, testing and diagnostics, some service procedures when component replacement is required, alignment procedures, and we'll finish it off with a couple of case studies. Mm -hmm. uh, system operations, the building control systems are designed to keep the vehicle tracking in the same direction as the driver has pointed the car. Um, <clears throat> obviously, if the car is out of, out, of, um, out of alignment or it's in a skid or something like that, then the vehicle is going to step in and try and get the vehicle back on track. And typically, when the vehicle is, is controlling the car to a certain extent, there should be some kind of a warning light in the dash or something like that to blink to alert the driver to the fact that the car has uh, taken over control. When the car is out of line, the system will perform some or all of the following corrections. It will apply wheel-specific brakes to correct the skid. On some vehicles, it may stiffen up one side of the suspension to keep the vehicle level if it's required and it will generally request some kind of reduced torque from the engine controller via um, some kind of a communication circuit, either a CAN bus or dedicated communication lines between the anti-lock controller and the PCM. Typical components uh, common to all systems, wheel speed sensors, obviously software and programming, the hydraulic control unit, accelerometers, steering angle sensors, and some method of reducing torque, um, communication, bus lines, that sort of thing. And the car may also have, depending on uh, level of vehicle, suspension control, radar sensors, cameras, uh, the ability to pre-charge a brake pedal to get ready for a crash, all of that kind of stuff that we cover more in our ADES class than we do in this class. Requirements to handle traction control, stability control, and ABS, we have to be able to measure vehicle speed, wheel speed, steering angle, and brake input. With this information, the ECM can then modulate braking and engine torque to keep the car stable under all driving conditions. Uh, so, typically, the, the unit or the component that's used for this is called an accelerometer, and they allow for the measurement of body motion. So Generally, what we're talking about here is yaw, how far the vehicle is tilted from center or how much the vehicle is turning, and then longitudinal movement, which basically is the car accelerating and decelerating uh, in a straight line. And then we measure sideward motion of the vehicle or lateral movement, where we measure how far the vehicle or how quickly the vehicle is moving from side to side. But these measurements allow the ECU to determine the vehicle attitude under pretty much any driving condition. Additional accelerometers um, or additional measurements with all of this data, we can now calculate roll, pitch, yaw. So <clears throat> the vehicle is, uh, can pretty much measure any uh, direction the car is pointing up, down, sideways, or whatever. So we have a pretty complete picture based on this of, of where the car is going and, and how it's getting there. Accelerometers come in a whole bunch of different shapes and sizes. They're typically rated by the number of axes that they can measure. One, two, three, one, two or three axis units are available. Most units today use two or three axis accelerometers. And if you take a look at the picture at the top of the page, you can see a three axis accelerometer. So this guy is capable of measuring all vehicle angles all at the same time. Uh, and if you take a look at the wiring diagram to the right here on this GM accelerometer, you can see that it 
it's a single unit and it's looking at all three axis vehicle axes at the same time so all it's a three axis accelerometer where all the the measurements are done by one unit now as far as accelerators or sorry accelerometers and their operation i basically copied and pasted this right off a website you can read through it here but um, I don't know what all of that means. I mean, uh, and, and I don't need to know. Typically, an accelerometer has some kind of a movable mass that is that the accelerometer is able to measure the movement of. So the movable mass is suspended as the car is moved forward, backwards, sideways, or whatever. The mass moves with it. That changes basically the position of the sensing units. And from there, this thing can produce a voltage or a digital signal that's sent out relative to the angle of the vehicle. So that's how they're measuring um, movement. Now that we understand kind of how accelerometers work, uh, location typically uh, varies a little bit, but <clears throat> typically uh, they're mounted uh, in the tunnel of the car, uh, on a hard surface, generally flat. And you can see in the example shown here that this standalone sensor uh, is actually part of the airbag module. Again, that's, um, that's common as well. The reason for that is pretty simple, actually, in that a lot of airbag modules use uh, accelerometers to measure the rate of deceleration, part of their strategy in deciding whether to the airbag or not. Now, when it comes to testing, uh, the sensors typically have two different types of output. You have analog, which is basically a varying signal between about 0.5 and 4.5 volts. And then we have digital sensors that typically talk or communicate their output along some kind of a CAN bus or dedicated serial data line. Analog sensors are <coughs> easy to test with voltmeters and that kind of stuff. Generally with a digital sensor, you can use a scan tool. Not to say that you can't use a scan tool on the analog sensor as well. So we're gonna start off with analog testers. And generally, these things are provided with a five volt reference voltage and a ground. And then the output, the analog output, generally speaking, on these sensors, if the sensor is not moving, i.e. it's not accelerating, it's not decelerating, it's not tipped or anything like that, it should put out about 2.5 volts. Obviously, as you move the sensor one way or the other, the voltage is going to go up and down from that. But if the car is stationary on a level surface, these sensors should put out very, very close to 2.5 volts. If it's not, basically power and ground testing, make sure that it's mounted correctly, and if it is, it's time for a new sensor. The other thing you can do with a sensor is if you can physically get it into your hand, is you can tip it around and you can watch the output change. And again, put it back on a flat surface. It should read about 2.5 volts. Or you can drive the car. And as you're driving the car, accelerate, decelerate, turn it, whatever, the accelerometer should show you the turn. So... If it's not possible or efficient to remove the sensor, then road testing is pretty simple, and you just hook up a scan tool or a voltmeter, and away you go. <clears throat> Here we're looking at an analog or longitudinal sensor under hard braking. It goes along at about 2.5 volts. The brakes are applied. <clears throat> the voltage drops down to about 1.28 volts, and then as the car kind of settles in, the voltage rebounds to 2.5. This is a this is a sensor doing uh, what it should. This is a normal sort of sequence of events for one of these sensors. <clears throat> digital, a little bit different. Typically, uh, digital sensors, your diagnostics are, are code-based, and generally, you'll get a sensor corrupt data, sensor not communicating, or something like that. There are four possible failure areas, power and ground, pretty obvious some kind of an internal failure, which there should be a code if the, if the sensor is communicating okay. Sensor not communicating. So if you uh, 
have one of these things, the first thing you do is go to the sensor and check and make sure that it's powered and grounded properly. <clears throat> and then from there, you do a quick check at a communication bus. In this case, we're dealing with a CAN bus, and you can see by the scope shot here that we have a typical CAN signal. So if this thing's not communicating, it's powered and grounded properly, and we have a good CAN bus signal, signal into it, then obviously the sensor is no good. Okay. Testing them for accuracy. Uh, again, you can do this on a road test. Basically, drive the car. Here we're testing a yaw sensor. The car is being driven straight ahead. The uh, yaw sensor should report that the car is being driven straight ahead, and that's what the steering angle sensor shows. Okay. And then as we turn the car back and forth, not drastic turns, but sort of gentle rolling turns, that kind of stuff. Where the car is not getting out of line, you can see how the yaw sensor and the steering angle sensor sort of track each other. Again, you're looking at a good uh, sensor here. However, if, if you were turning the steering wheel and the yaw sensor was going crazy and you knew physically you weren't doing that, then it would be time to replace the yaw sensor. If the sensors don't agree, there's something wrong with whatever sensor does not agree with what the car is doing. Again, you, you know what you're doing to the car, accelerating, decelerating, turning hard, whatever, the sensor should reflect that. Now, if you have to replace uh, any of these sensors, my advice to you would be to go in and <clears throat> look up the procedure. Some of these things, it's as simple as bolting them in, uh, going in with the scan tool, doing a relearn, while others um, have to have a fuse pulled or whatever the case may be. So the reset or the calibration procedure on these things can vary quite a bit from car to car. Just make sure you read it ahead of time so you know what you're doing before you hook up to the car. That brings us to wheel speed sensors. We've been testing them for years, but they continue to set false codes or cause problems without setting codes, which is even worse. Neither situation is good and may require advanced testing techniques to get to the root of the problem. Traditional testing techniques may not be sufficient to solve all problems. Typically, you are basically doing continuity tests, tests on the wires and or resistance tests on the sensors. That's the typical sort of test on these things. Um, that's not good enough anymore in a lot of cases. So sensors, uh, wheel speed sensors, however, come in two varieties. On the left, we have a passive non-powered, so this would be an AC generator type or a PM generator type of sensor. It would output an AC voltage. And then on the right, we have a powered sensor, uh, typically powered by the ABS module, and this guy would put out some sort of a digital signal. So when it comes to passive sensor testing or AC generators, typically what you're going to do is do a resistance test on or something like that, make sure the resistance okay, and then scope the darn thing. Uh, if you uh, scope it, if you take a look at the uh, lab scope screen on the left there, you can see that these two sensors are cycling at about the same rate, but the sensor on top isn't producing as much voltage as the one on the bottom. So obviously there was a problem with the top sensor. Right. Uh, so Typically here, we would be resistance testing and testing for signatures, that kind of stuff. Also, driving the car. Um, we do this a lot, especially if we've got uh, unwarranted activation or erratic wheel speed sensor signal codes, that sort of thing. And generally what you want to do, if you suspect that the sensor is dropping out or something like that, is drive the car around fairly slow and then slowly accelerate and slowly decelerate. And as you can see here, as we're slowly decelerating in this particular vehicle, the right rear sensor drops out while the other three sensors are still reporting. That can only be caused by a bad sensor of some sort, I'm not exactly sure what the issue is, but it will require further investigation because we know from the other three wheels that the car is still rolling, it's just that the right rear wheel speed sensor is not showing it. <coughs> That brings us to the powered sensor. These guys are a bit of a different animal. Uh, typically, the ABS control module is going to power these guys up. 
it will, depending on manufacturer, provide different power side voltages, 5, 7, 9, or 12 are pretty popular with these guys. If you're unsure uh, what you're dealing with, basically unplug the sensor, measure across the two wires coming down from the ABS module, put a voltmeter with the key on, and you should be able to tell uh, what your sensor voltage will be operating at. And then from there, uh, you want to do a signature test on it. I like to do the signature test at the ABS module if possible. It's not always possible to do it this way, but if you can get away with it, why not? And you can see here, looking at my scope screen, that as we rotate the wheel, this thing's putting out about a 12 volt um, digital signal. Obviously, as the wheel speeds up, um, the pulses will get closer together. Same thing as if I slow the vehicle down, they'll get further apart. Now, this is one type of signal put out by these guys. Okay. I would call this a large amplitude uh, signal. Unfortunately, they're not all like this. In some of the newer cars, uh, what you get actually is um, very, very low signal voltages. As an example, <clears throat> I believe this is a Nissan, but if you take a look at the scope shot on the left, you can see that the wheel is stationary. And then on the right, we're spinning it. Now this, on the right, you can see kind of a, a bit of a square wave, but it's sitting at 12 volts. So the amplitude of the wave is only two or three tenths of a volt. It makes it very, very hard to see, especially if you're looking for glitches, which means we need a different way of taking a look at this thing. And there's a couple of ways you can do this. Number one, you can trick the scope. And to do that, you're going to basically um, put the positive lead of your scope on the positive battery cable, or, sorry, and the negative lead down on the signal wire. The other thing you can do, if your scope will allow it, is to AC couple the scope. This will take care of any DC voltage. It'll get rid of the 12 volts, and you can set your scale accordingly. Now to give you an idea of how important it is to be able to test these wheel speed sensors in a bunch of different ways, uh, I'm going to use a case study that was actually uh, given to me by uh, Kevin, or sorry, yeah, Kevin Shaw from uh, OK Tire in Thornbury. Kevin's a really smart tech, and he did a really good job on this one. So the vehicle here is a 2008 Hyundai Vera Cruze, ABS light on. It sets a C1 or C1275. Problem is intermittent, but it can be reproduced on a road test. Unfortunately, hooking up a scan tool puts the ABS module in diagnostic mode, which really doesn't help. Um, it's had a couple of wheel speed sensors put on, and I think the dealer suggested a G sensor. And the code, the 1275, is a longitudinal G sensor range slash performance error. So when you go in, uh, what they want you to do is monitor the G sensor, drive the vehicle at sort of a steady rate um, at around uh, six, seven miles an hour without uh, accelerating or whatever. And then they want you to accelerate and decelerate. And while you're going steady or driving along at a steady rate, the sensor should register, sorry, the sensor should register uh, point or G or less. Um, which this sensor did, and then the reading should go up or down from there if you accelerate or decelerate, and this sensor also uh, did that. So just from what you can see on the scan tool, this sensor looks to be okay. And then <clears throat> if you follow the trouble tree down, it gets to the component inspection uh, section of this thing, and as you're going through it, it says check installation of G-Sensor, which is uh, standard. But then step two says check damage of rotor teeth or wheel bearing. Now, they don't really explain why they want you to check that, but they want you to check it. And it's just a visual check. Now, apparently that was done and everything was okay. And then they want you to scope the sensor while you're driving it. The specification is approximately 2.5. And then as you're accelerating and decelerating, the voltage goes up or down accordingly. And that was done. 
and there were no faults indicated. And if you go back to the trouble tree here, you just kind of wind up going around in circles. So <clears throat> what Kevin did was he focused in on this uh, one sentence here, which really doesn't tell you much other than they want you to check these things. So there is an assumption here that the rotor teeth or the tone rings or the ABS wheel speed sensors are important to what's going on here. Now this is not much of an explanation and it sure doesn't tell you what's going on here, but here's the scope shot from the four wheel speed sensors. And if you look at it, there's really nothing here that stands out as being uh, bad. All the sensors or all the signals look pretty good. There's no dropouts, glitches, or anything like that. Now, fortunately, using a Pico here, there's more than one way to look at these signals. And what we're going to do uh, is create a math channel. And a math channel is just a mathematical formula that you can build in the Pico software. And you're basically telling the scope that you that instead of looking at the signals digitally, you want to look at them graphically. Now the scope needs to um, it, it needs the math in order to be able to plot this for you. But if you take a look at my example here, the first segment is 150 hertz. That puts me right down the center here. The next one, 152. So it's sped up a little bit. So you see how the my graph goes up and then 149 we're slowing down so you can see it slow down again so graphing or using a math channel on on a digital signal is a pretty good way to tell whether there's any imperfections or not now in order to create a math channel <coughs> you need to be able to um, you need some numbers so basically, you're going to take a look at the signal. And the nice thing about Pico is you can do this after you have the signal recorded. And <clears throat> on the recording, there was a maximum frequency measured of 475 hertz. So if we build a math channel uh, with some wiggle room on either side of that, typically between 100 and 700 hertz, we should be able to see uh, what the computer sees as far as this signal goes. And now, take a look at this recording when we apply our math channels to the wheel speed sensor uh, readings you can see kind of right in this area here and here and here on the uh, I believe it's the left rear wheel speed sensor that you've got some uh, very erratic read, sorry, you've got some very erratic readings on the left rear wheel speed sensor. Now this is caused by imperfections in the tone ring that are not visible to the naked eye. And what's going on here is, according to the wheel speed sensor, the car is speeding up and slowing down, but the G sensor is not showing it. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the software in the, um, brake controller for this thing wasn't programmed to be able to pick this particular fault out so it defaulted and set a code for the G sensor when the problem was actually a wheel speed sensor. Okay. Well, from the scope it's clear that the left rear sensor has a problem. The right rear sensor also shows a problem but it's not as bad. You can see that here. That's the green trace right above the um, brown one. It's erratic as well, but it's not as bad. The sensor signal looks normal when viewed on a scope, so we know that this, the, the, the circuitry and the sensor is actually being triggered, triggered, but the frequency is changing. Not necessarily visible to the naked eye, but it is changing. We know that the frequency is generated by the tone ring. Therefore, uh, this vehicle needs a couple of tone rings to fix this problem. Okay. So here the vehicle is after replacing the tone rings. Apparently there was an update to the sensors or a TSB that had updated sensors. They were put in there as well, but you can clearly see here that the car is fixed and uh, problem solved.